Hi, welcome to uh, this evening's event, a talk back about Nicotiana. My name is John Bell. I'm the director of the Ballad Institute and Museum of, of Puppetry at the University of Connecticut. And on behalf of the Ballad Institute and our friends at Yukon's Asian and Asian American Studies Institute and our puppet arts program at Yukon, we want to welcome you to this online event of Nicotiana, a talk back about Nicotiana, a short play about um, a short play with Crankies by Rumput featuring Balinese puppeteer I Gusti Putu Sudarta, who we're waiting for because there's a 12 hour difference in, from our time to Indonesia time. But um, I'm very happy that uh, we're joined here by um, Andy McGraw um, from Richmond and uh, Hannah uh, Standiford and also my colleague, Matthew Cohen, my colleague from the Puppet Arts Program at the University of Connecticut, who made this all happen. We had been hoping to have all of this, uh, all of these performances come together as a live event at the Ballard Institute. And of course, because of the, um, uh, the coronavirus situation, we were not able to do that. But in fact, we're able to do a little bit more now online which is great. This morning, in, uh, in, is this morning our time, we did another version of this event uh, that was in Indonesian with Gusti Sudarta. So now we're happy to, to do a, the event again in English. So Matthew, um, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you very much for making this happen. Thank you, John, and we hope that uh, Gusti Sudarta will be uh, logging in shortly. Uh, the situation uh, where he is sheltering in, in Bali uh, is not the most uh, e easy uh, internet of connections. And so spotty connections or lost connections are kind of the way things are where he is. Um, but I wanted to introduce the two uh, uh, artists who are here with us today uh, to talk about this uh, really interesting uh, project, uh, Nicotiana, which for me really is a model uh, for thinking about long-term collaboration between American artists and Indonesian artists, um, and raises all kinds of uh, interesting questions, uh, and uh, I think themes and approaches uh, to working uh, in a, a really a truly uh, collaborative way. Uh, and the way I'd like to structure our discussion today, like the, the, our discussion uh, this morning, is to get some background on uh, previous uh, uh, iterations of this long-term collaboration uh, between Andy McGraw uh, and Rumput uh, and uh, Gusti Sudarta. Uh, and uh, then to uh, look at some uh, clips from the video of Nicotiana, uh, which is available online uh, and was recorded in the very last moments uh, bef uh, before the, the room put, the, this ensemble was produced, this had to disband and shelter. So we're very fortunate that the project, while it didn't actually tour, reach us up at the University of Connecticut, uh, was able to be documented in, a, I think, a very interesting way. And then to uh, talk about uh, how this project uh, might be generative of future work, uh, and also to take questions uh, from uh, viewers who are watching this live stream uh, right now. And I should say, if there are any questions which come up uh, in course, uh, that we'll, we'll try to uh, address them uh, if they're directly relevant. If not, we'll uh, hold off uh, until after uh, the, uh, we've wrapped up our part of the conversation. Um, so uh, uh, some brief introductions first. Uh, Andy McGraw is Associate Professor of Music at the University of Richmond. Um, he's, his PhD is in ethnomusicology from Wesleyan University here in Connecticut, not far from us at UConn. Um, and uh, has uh, studied and collaborated with leading Balinese and Javanese performers 
uh, during his many years of research in Indonesia, as well as since arriving at the University of Richmond. Uh, he's best known as the author of a book called Radical Traditions, Reimagining Culture and Balinese Contemporary Music, which came out in 2013 from Oxford University Press, and is currently working on a project called uh, Sounding the Commonwealth, which involves research in, uh, in jails, uh, in, mo in a monastery, in a commune in Virginia, uh, looking at musical practices there. And in addition to being a co-director and co-founder of the Rumput Ensemble, which plays Kronchung music, we'll hear more about Kronchung as we go on in this conversation, he also uh, directs the gamelan uh, Radha Kasuma. And I guess that's the gamelan we see in the background there, Andy, is that it's right? Half, it's half of it, yeah. Oh, half, half of the instrument. So that, is that the pelog or the slendro half? This is pelog and slendro, but the Balinese sets over there, so. I see, yeah, we, okay. We do both. So, so, so half, half of the instruments are behind us. Um, uh, uh, Han, Hannah Standiford uh, is a graduate student in uh, University of Pittsburgh in ethnomusicology uh, and as a researcher of uh, Kronchong music, which is a traditional string band um, of, of uh, Indonesia. Uh, and she's interested in questions of national identity and nostalgia and how that intersects with this uh, musical form. Um, she has had two uh, uh, extensive periods of, of uh, study and fieldwork uh, in Java. 2014 as a Dharma Siswa student at, uh, in Solo, uh, and in 2017 as a Fulbright uh, student research uh, grant awardee, uh, also uh, in Solo. In between, she was one, founded this ensemble, Rumput, uh, which uh, plays Kroncho music, does crankies, collaborates with Gamelan, uh, and is the, the host of this uh, uh, project with uh, Gusti Sudarta. Uh, and she also uh, is researching social swing dancing. Um, so uh, let's go back in time a little bit, Andy, I guess to uh, your first uh, period, stint of research and study in Bali, uh, where you and, and, and Gusti first met. And you could fill us in, in the background of uh, that, uh, beginnings of that collaboration and, and how, that, how that meeting happened and, what kind of things you were doing in Bali when you first met uh, Gusti. Sure, and I hope he can join us. I'm kind of also monitoring WhatsApp over here to see if he can see my messages. I'm, I'm, I hope the power is on in that village right now. Um, let's see, I, when, I, when I first went to Indonesia, I, I wanted to make sure I had a, a really solid um, education in, in traditional arts. And so I went to the kind of uh, center of the Ginder Wayang tradition. This is the, the, the ensemble that accompanies the Balinese shadow play. Uh, and went to the leading teacher, Pa Locheng, uh, from Sukwadi Village. And at that time, his studio was filled um, primarily with uh, young Japanese women. And he, he recommended I go to his star student, uh, this guy named Gusti Sudartha up in uh, Badulu Village. And I, and I went there and and uh, Gusti also rejected me because he was deferring to his teacher. And so then Pat Lo Cheng kind of accepted me into the studio. But from the very beginning, I was kind of hearing this uh, about this legendary player and, and Pat Lo Cheng, who um, uh, maybe was not the, the most modest person. I mean, he was incredibly talented. Um, but understood the depth of his own talent. At one point in, in one of my early lessons said, Gusti, yeah, he's, he's better than me, which was, you know, shocking. Uh, and then my kind of perception of, of, of Gusti kind of um, uh, changed um, because I knew him as someone who was really at the forefront of experimentalism. Mm. And, and it's sometimes the case it's sometimes the case in a lot of traditions in which people, uh, in which people that are really uh, dedicated to experimentalism haven't also spent a lot of time in, in the more conservative traditions. Right. But that's not the case uh, with Gusti Sudartha and a lot of the artists he works with. So they, they are really renowned as kind of holding the center of the tradition into the next generation, but also doing really radical things with it. Um, and so I was really interested in, in um, experimentation with him and especially another composer named um, 
uh, Pat Mare Subandi, another named Pat Udana, and those three collaborated um, with an Australian group of shadow puppeteers and uh, musicians for a project called the Theft of Sita Project, yep. which toured all around the world, I think starting in 2000. That's right, yeah. And they got really turned on to experimental theatrical approaches to shadow theater. And they were turning those musicians on to Balinese approaches to time and ensemble interaction. Um, and so I had started working with them when they were like really, really energized through this collaborative kind of um, intercultural globe trotting uh, project. Um, so they had recently returned from this, I think it was a two year tour, Gusti said. Yeah, yeah, and they had toured a couple times. Yeah. Um, and so they were, they have very big ears uh, and really open minded about the relationship, the potential relationship between music and theater and narrative and how they could all inform each other. And sometimes the narrative doesn't always have to come from the theater, it could come from the music. And then the theatrical component is following the music. I mean, just um, really excited to try new things. And I kind of, I think I was really fortunate to kind of meet them at that time. And what in your role was in, as a musician in these collaborations then, which took the form of theater, music, dance, or puppetry, I imagine as well. Yeah, I mean, I was primarily a student, um, but you know, the, the kind of aesthetic economy of Bali is so intense. Um, there are so many performances. Um, there are so many contests uh, that they always need new material. Mm. And if I'm not the greatest Skinder Wayang musician, at least I have a different perspective on things. At least I've studied all these other traditions and they could kind of work me to get these kind of off the wall ideas uh, that they can then use as kind of grist for their compositional mill, right? right? So ideas that I might think, oh, I could take this West African rhythm and we can play with it in this way. Um, I would then hear in a composition by Subandi and Gusti the next year in a much more sophisticated you know, form. I, and that's, that's very clear. So, um, this was in the course of doing PhD research then for you, or was this pre-PhD? This was pre-PhD and PhD. Yeah. 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 So this was, and this was your, it was those. You, I, this, this morning you talked about this, this gila gila, crazy kinds of collaborations, which became the the subject of your book on radical tradition. I guess. Yeah, and the and the challenge was often who could be, who could be the craziest, yeah. who can outdo someone else with just a, a totally unexpected idea. Right? And so in 20, 2007, when you first invited Gusti Sudarta, it was with a desire to continue this craziness then in Richmond. Well, yeah, I mean, we wanted, I had just gotten the, the gig here and we wanted to establish a community group. Um, and I wanted to do this with him. Um, I wanted to co-found it with him. Uh, and we needed someone who could do the proper ceremonies and who could sanctify the ensemble, sanctify the musicians with the ensemble, give the ensemble a name. Um, and so we brought him over for a semester. There he is. Hello, ah. Lee. Hello, minta maaf. Ini saya tadi ke pasar lupa. Ke pasar. Oke, Ken. Nah, ada apa um, we won't translate that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so when we brought him here, um, we also set up a collaboration with the, ensemble, the chamber ensemble in residence here at the University of Richmond, the Eighth Blackbird Ensemble, uh, which is a pro lunaire ensemble based in Chicago uh, that would that had just kind of uh, kind of hit its stride at that time. I think they they had just won their first Grammy that year. And they were interested in working with Gusti, partly because they were coming from a tradition in which maybe the time was more fluid than it might be for jazz musicians. The techniques were open. They were doing a lot of extended techniques, but everything was on paper for the most part. And to be able to improvise on the fly 
was something they were really interested in, in. And you have to be able to do that if you're accompanying a dialogue, really, in any Indonesian tradition. It's improvisatory, and you've got to be able to just uh, react. And so we created a, a kind of open-ended accompaniment for them. And Pat Gusti was experimenting with faculty in kinetic imaging from the Virginia Commonwealth University to use uh, Nintendo Wii technology and uh, digital scans and animations of Wayang, kind of controlling those with one hand while manipulating traditional shadows with the other hand. And, and so we were able to kind of establish a, a, a traditional community group and then also do the kind of experimental, you know, stretching out material while he was here. So, Pat Gusti, thank you for uh, appearing. We're very grateful you're here. Um, could we ask you what uh, the, in 20, 2007, when you first came to University of Richmond, uh, what were the, the things you found most stimulating out of that collab early uh, uh, moment in this multi-year collaboration? What the, what what, do, what benefits did you take out of working with with Andy, and the people in Virginia for your work in Bali? Acousti. Yeah. Hey. Hello. We frozen. Mau di terjemahkan. Should we translate? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's try that. You want to go okay. ahead? Or... Okay. Jadi manfaatnya bekerja sama ini Andy pada awalnya tahun 2007 bagaimana itu? Wah, ini menarik untuk saya karena pertama kali apa? I think we're frozen here. Yeah, yeah. itu yang menarik sekali bagi saya. Yeah. Itu intinya. Ah. <laughs> he basically said it was very interesting. I, I think we lost all but the very end of that. But that's yeah. what we're yeah. Bisa dulang, can we repeat? Yeah, itu menarik sekali waktu 2007 itu karena pertama saya apa kolaborasi apa wayangnya dengan apa dengan chamber uh, apa ensemble ya dan itu ada dalam penggarapan itu kan scene by scene itu memang komposisinya digarap dengan pasti ya artinya memang lagu itu sudah diciptakan untuk scene itu pasti sekali gitu beda dengan artinya walaupun begitu dalam scene itu dalam uh, adegan itu ada di, diberikan ruang-ruang improvisasi untuk dalang Bali itu bisa mengembangkan permainan dialog sesuai dengan tema yang pada saat uh, apa dalam adegan itu nah itu menarik ya itu. Do you want to translate Andy? Well, I think it's interesting because he kind of he kind of said the opposite of what I said. Yeah. Um, I said you know we we left all these open sections for the musicians to to react to the dialogue and that was the that was the kind of uh, point of it and he said oh it was very interesting it was very different for me because all the music was, was really rigidly set and there was a little bit of room for me to for me to interact with them so <laughs> I think that's actually really an interesting uh, response right you think uh, you you're, you're having one experience culturally going in one direction and, and sometimes the opposite experience is going in the other direction it can still be mutually beneficial <laughs> yeah <laughs> This is true. So the, this was 2007, uh, and the the musical base was there was there was Balinese music involved in that as well as uh, for that one. No, it was it was all performed by the chamber ensemble. All by the chamber ensemble, um, and uh, shadow ballads from 2013 was it? I think it was 2016, 16. 2017. 16, 16 17. Uh, involves quite a mixture. That's a later collaboration of yours. Um, do you want to tell us, uh, give us some background on that to set up the clip, which we'll look at? Sure. Um, 
Well, I, and I think Hannah can talk about the, the, the kind of context of, of founding the, the Cronchong Ensemble, but I'll say that um, that music was something that I heard during part of my research, my PhD research in solo. And I was studying with a, a well-known experimental composer named Iwai Ansadra, who is from Bali, but was living in solo. And he ran a, a, a really amazing a uh, contemporary ensemble called Sonosini, which is still active. Uh, Pat Sadra died in, in 2010, but the group is still active. And there were two young members in that group, Penny Tandrarini and Dana Sugianto, just outstanding musicians, again in tradition and in experimental forms, who are now faculty at the National Conservatory in Solo, and who we've, we've brought uh, here to teach uh, Javanese gamelan. Uh, but Donis especially is, is really well known as a Cronchong musician. So mm. at a certain point, I kind of asked the, the gamelan, you know, said, well, we're in Virginia. How many of us in this group actually play string instruments? And, you know, a lot of people raise their hand. Um, there are certain kind of uh, connections between the old time tradition and Cronchong in terms of the kinds of instrumentation the kinds of keys you play in, the kinds of chords that you play in those keys, such that um, some of the music kind of falls nicely in the hands of people that, that might have st studied American or even bluegrass or Americana music. And that, that's more of Hannah's background. And so we talked about the potential for starting a group. And maybe Hannah, you could take it from there and, and talk about that. You're muted though. Muted. Here we go. Um, so, uh, right, when I applied for Dharma Siswa and, and went in 2014, at that time, um, the gamelan was playing almost exclusively Balinese, I think. And so in some ways, it would have been more logical for me to go to Bali and continue doing that. Um, but I had an understanding, which was kind of true, that I could keep studying Balinese gamelan at EC Solo, at the Arts Institute in Solo. Um, and, then, and then I expanded that into um, Javanese gamelan a bit. But when I, when I went, I chose solo because I had, I had heard just like a couple of videos online, like nothing special, but I heard some videos of crunch on music and just had like kind of like a hunch about it and was just kind of curious about it. Um, and, then, and then that's kind of what like caught my attention when I was in solo and I ended up focusing mainly on that. Um, and so during that time, um, I was sending videos of crunch on musicians back to Andy to share with the group. So we'd take a video of the full group um, and then I asked musicians to play along with that recording and I would just zoom in on hand so we could see technique and the notes they were playing, etc. Which was really, really um, kind of like, you know, why would you want this? Um, you know, like it, it didn't make sense of like, well, why would you want this instrument like decontextualized from the group? It's like, that's, that's how we need to do it. Um, so yeah, and I sent those back to Andy during that time when the internet uh, was not what it is today and it, each video would take all night to upload. Um, yeah, and then um, I came back and joined what he had already started in 2015. I got back in May of 2015 when we went from there. And, and at that time, Pat Gusti and I were talking, you know, kind of always talking about experiments in, in shadow theater because there's, there's such an active uh, kind of dynamic feedback loop or, or, or cycle of inspirations and ideas, especially from the West Coast, especially from like Larry Reed's um, uh, ensemble and ensembles like manual cinema and all these groups where the, these ideas just kind of constantly flying back and forth. It's, it's kind of hard to even tell uh, where things come from originally if, if we care about that at all. Um, so there are these ideas that are shared between, between all of these different scenes of shadow making. Um, and we were talking about Wayan Beber, uh, which are the scroll, uh, uh, the, the Indonesian scroll, uh, they're called wayang, but they don't always involve shadows. It could just be an unscrolled um, uh, panorama, like a small panorama, maybe that size. Um, and at that time, we were learning in the group uh, about Henry Box Brown, who was a um, uh, famous uh, African, he was born an uh, African-American slave in Virginia and worked in the, in the tobacco industry. Didn't did he work as a stemmer or something in Richmond, Hannah? Do you know? I, I, I don't remember if he actually worked in the, but I, in the tobacco industry, but he lived in the city as a kind of, with a kind of autonomy that, that 
that slaves were, were given um, in, in Richmond. Uh, and when the railroad was established between Richmond and Philly, he had himself boxed up as a package in a tiny, tiny box and escaped to freedom. And then when he got there, he created, he, he later went to Boston and collaborated with, with artists in Boston and created a very large, what at that time was called a moving panorama, which could be, you know, this tall and, and some people advertise their moving panoramas as being a kilometer long. I, I can't imagine any of them were actually that long, but they were, you know, uh, unscrolled with, um, for Henry Box Brown, it was the tale of slavery in the South and his experiences um, in the South and, and escaping to freedom. Now the, the uh, Fugitive Slave Act was still uh, active then. So he then left Boston and went to the UK and was touring Europe, kind of educating the abolitionist crowd about, about this using moving panorama. So there was an interesting kind of Richmond connection to something that Pat Gusti understood as Beber. Mm. Um, and we thought about, well, let's look into this. And there must be people doing this. And this is where we kind of bumped into the whole uh, the vibrant subculture, modern subculture of crankies, which is the kind of reinvented version of it, essentially reinvented by folks from Bread and Puppet, uh, as I understand it, you know, in, this, in the 60s and 70s in New York. Uh, and that tradition has kind of continued. And so we started collaborating with uh, Anna and Elizabeth uh, for that project. So we have Kronchong music, a popular music of Western Indonesia. Crankies, this uh, kind of reinvented uh, uh, storytelling uh, entertainment. Uh, Wayang uh, Kulit of, of Bali, the Shadow Puppet Theater, ritual art has been reconceived in this postmodern setting. Javanese artists as well who are bringing gamelan sensibility. Have I missed any? Um, a few more as well. There's probably. Some... <laughs> yeah. Let, let's take a look at that clip if we can. Emily, can you play the clip from uh, Shadow Ballads? Okay, we're back. Uh, I think this is extraordinary collaboration at many, many different levels. Um, and I, just watching this, um, I'm, I'm taken back in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an instant to my own time at, uh, at EC Solo. Um, and uh, Pat Gusti recently finished his PhD at EC Solo. You mentioned earlier that you were studying uh, uh, or, or studying with or, or about Pat Sadra, I, I was a boarder at his house yeah. very briefly when I was a, when I was a Fulbright in, in, in solo. Hannah was in was in solo as well. I, I'm beginning to see the nexus and the connections, uh, uh, and I, I'm feeling them in a very strong way. But Pat Gusti, could you tell us because uh, uh, Ibu Penny, who is the singer there, is also a lecturer 
at at uh, so at Solo and and one of the disciples of Rahayu Supanga, the great Gamelan yeah. Um How do how do you how how do you see the relationship? How, I mean, how was that like for you to work with these artists from Solo in America? We're doing a contemporary wayang with artists from Solo and and musicians and cranky artists from the U.S. What, what was that experience like? Uh, menarik sekali. Sebenarnya uh, saya 2007 pertama kali ya menginjakkan kaki di Solo untuk belajar. Nah, di sana untuk proses kreatifnya luar biasa apa ya progresnya maju dan dan ada pikiran yang sangat terbuka sekali untuk menerima hal-hal yang baru. Dan menariknya kebanyakan dari mereka berangkat dari akar tradisi yang sangat kuat sekali. Ah, begitu juga dengan Mbak Penny Canarini ini karena beliau ini berasal dari keluarga dalang uh, yang kakaknya juga pintan pintar sekali nyinyen uh, Mbak Sukesi. Tapi untuk apa pikiran-pikiran yang karya yang sentuhan apa konsep pemikiran baru itu juga siap sekali karena Penny sering berkolaborasi dengan seniman-seniman dari berbagai negara dan juga ikut dengan karya-karyanya uh, Pak Rayu Supangah. Nah, kita sering ketemu sebelumnya di Solo juga. Dan kebetulan waktu S2, saya dan Penny itu satu kelas, gitu, satu angkatan. Jadi kita ada latar belakang yang yang sama ya, berangkat dari dari kekentalan tradisi itu. Lalu kita bertransformasi ke dalam dunia penciptaan yang kekinian. Ya. Lalu ketemu di Amerika uh, dengan artis-artis dari Amerika dan Saya pertama kali bersentuhan dengan mendengar yang old time musik, lalu ada cranky. Cranky itu ramai itu mengingatkan saya waktu masa kecil gimana uh, dunia bercerita di Bali ya. Tapi yang di Bali itu tidak memakai alat peraga wayang atau tapi memang kekuatan bercerita itu yang ditampilkan uh, menjelang tidur itu gitu. Nah itu yang saya ing- apa jadi connect sekali dengan dengan cranky itu dengan apalacian gitu. Nah apa yang dari segi musikal saya rasakan cunnya itu sangat menarik sekali apa skill yang dimainkan oleh old time itu saya sangat suka sekali seperti ada kedekatan rasa ya kalau saya gitu apa ya tektonik atau apa larasnya ya oke okay, oke okay. mm-hmm. oh you want me to do that yeah could you okay there's a lot there let's see uh, what did he start with he said I think well, he had, he had gone to Solo in 2007. Pagrisi Tolong uh, uh, Sorry, I got off Sala. Um, he, he had gone there in 2007 okay. and was really kind of uh, uh, connected with these with these musicians like Penny and Donis. And in fact, were, uh, for the master's class, they were in the same class. And, and as I was describing Pagrisi as someone who is really strong in tradition and experimental, he, he described them kind of in those terms as well. No. Um, and connecting with them here, he felt a really strong connection with with Crankies, and for him, they kind of uh, they stirred a kind of nostalgia, which I'm I'm kind of interested in, in learning more about. He wasn't, or maybe I wasn't catching it exactly the why it, it stirred a kind of nostalgia for him because he didn't connect it directly to to Wang Beber just no. now. Um, but, uh, and, and the Appalachian tunes, he felt a, a very strong connection to. And, you know, there are some of those tunes that are, uh, I was kind of, tr- I was trying to kind of keep notes on what turned them on, which, which of these tunes they really liked. And those tunes that kind of go towards something that's more pentatonic, uh, where there's not really, a, if you're a musician, like the thirds aren't really clear, uh, mm-hmm. or maybe there aren't thirds in the chords, right? Um, that that Penny and Goosey were really interested in those, and they could they could I think kind of enter them from the perspective of the Pelog or the Slindro scale uh, probably more easily than those pieces that are kind of really clearly oriented around functional harmony. Um, and so so there was a way, a very kind of quick way for us for us to kind of bring. Um, musical backgrounds together in a way that uh, wasn't um, that wasn't overwhelming, uh, but 
in which everyone was also having to stretch. And this, the, the cranky were made by members of the group. Is that right? Or the, there was internal. Hannah, yeah. So that was, you know, one of these projects where it's like, okay, we've got to do it all in spring break. And the reason we have to do it in spring break is the students are gone and we need a really long table in the art department to, to unroll all this Tyvek. And we've got to set it up like, you know, an assembly line. Okay, here's, you know, you go, you guys go do these trees here and we'll do this. And, and we've got to remember, and this is where, you know, Pat Gusti being there was, was crucial because I think we would have, um, we would have uh, forgotten about this. You, when you collaborate between a shadow master and the crankies, you have to leave a whole bunch of stuff out. Yeah. You, as you know, making a cranky, you have this, this inclination to just fill everything up. And what we, and we really had to fight that and listen to Pat Gusti for, for leaving spaces, meaningful spaces for the, the puppets to, to take kind of center stage. And how, how was that like for you, Pat Gusti, performing with a cranky? Was, how, how, did you, how did you work with the cranky as background, as partner? Ya menarik sekali karena dalam proses uh, yang sedo balad itu kan uh, kita boleh semua artis musisi ikut berpartisipasi potong uh, royong mengerjakan apa namanya cranky itu sebisanya gitu karena waktunya sangat terbatas waktu itu. Nah itu pertama dari segi teknis memang bagi saya waktu mainnya itu karena bukan pakai screen yang sesungguhnya ya karena ini otomatis kerengkinya jadi layar. Nah, itu diperlukan apa ya? persiapan yang khusus ya bagaimana mau bagaimana mau memanipulasi wayang itu agar supaya mau dan tidak begitu mengganggu apa panorama ini, kerengki ini gitu. Itu yang yang tantangannya waktu itu bagi saya. Tapi menarik bagi saya itu. Itu bisa dia ya, atas. Ya, yeah, he said it's, yeah, it's a challenge to it's a challenge to work with it, to work with that particular kind of screen. And, you know, if you, if you haven't worked with um, Javanese or Balinese uh, shadow puppeteers, you know, the screen is really, really taut and there's nothing on it. And the Balinese will kind of check the screen by flicking it and it should kind of sound like a drum. It should be that tight. And the cranky is just kind of loosely hanging Tyvek. And a lot, especially in Balinese Wayang, a lot of the technique is just smacking the screen with the yes. puppets. I mean, really hitting the screen. And, and I think it was really challenging for Pak Gusti because it's so built into the technique that he had to fight to keep from just, you know, <laughs> backing the Tyvek and having the whole thing, you know, flop over. So the uh, piece which we're uh, concerned with today, really, the central piece is Nicotiana, which also involves uh, Kronchong music uh, and Cranky. Um, but while this earlier piece, Shadow Bells, I believe had a Ramayana story. Is that right? Uh, no. Uh, Shadow Ballad, it's a little bit of a siapa? Saya lupa. Suta Soma apa? Uh, Ramayana. Ramayana, yeah. Pakai Rama, Laksamana, lalu yeah. ada Patih Nyarawana di sana, gitu. Sepionasio Nyarawana, ya. Yeah. Yeah. So with Nikotiana, so Ramayana was uh, the, the theme of, uh, of Shadow Ballads, but Nikotiana takes on a very different kind of subject, which is the global history of the tobacco industry. Um, so maybe you could tell us a few words about uh, how this process of uh, how, how the decision was made to, to to address tobacco within that group, Pat Gusti and and Penny and 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 some others. You know, Pat Gusti is one of the very few Indonesians I know now who doesn't smoke, and and, and so we we kind of talk about it because we we get caught up in rehearsals where we're smoking because everyone else is smoking and. Uh, Penny, she will say, I think there were some other reasons, but she will often say why, the reason she married her husband, who's a renowned instrument maker, um, the reason she married her husband is, is he was the only guy who didn't smoke in, in her class. Hmm. Um, and, and so this kind of conversation comes up about um, tobacco and sociality. 
and and the the real rise in the number of smokers since I met a lot of these people in in uh, the mid late nineties, and since moving to Richmond, um, I kind of slowly came to understand and through conversations with folks in Wumput, the extent to which um, companies like Altria um, underwrite arts in in cities like Richmond, and so we you know started doing some research about that, and you know discover that. Altria was Philip Morris, uh, all of the, the kind of sexy uh, brands that the Indonesians would, would ask me to bring to Indonesia uh, were, you know, Lucky Strike and Marlboro that were made in, in Richmond. Um, and then, uh, you know, being a part of the Richmond Folk Festival, a lot of the money for that comes from Altria. And after the master settlement agreement, the, the, the big agreement and uh, the big uh, kind of national lawsuit or combined lawsuits in 98, 96, 98, Philip Morris moved to Switzerland and um, reoriented a lot of its um, advertising uh, and, and, and market to Southeast Asia where there's less regulation and uh, bought up some of the largest Indonesian tobacco companies. And so in Indonesia, uh, there aren't the kinds of restrictions on advertising. Um, and especially advertising to kids that came out of the master settlement agreement in America. So a lot of the things that they were then disallowed to, to do in America, they were doing in Indonesia and especially um, supporting arts events. And this was a kind of conversation I'd have with Pat Gusti and, and Penny going back quite a ways. But moving to Richmond, we started really thinking about like, wait, could there be a connection here between the, the kinds of sponsorship of, of artistic activities in places like Richmond that we don't recognize as being sponsored by tobacco, but might in fact be connected at least um, through complex global capitalist <laughs> um, banking to the kinds of um, uh, really aggressive and detrimental uh, growth of that market and, and, and advertising in places like Indonesia. So it was a desire to explore this, the commonalities, the shared history, and these connections together. And to yeah, and, and it was a conversation that Pat Gusi and I were having yeah. uh, over Facebook, and, and, and you know, I had, to, I had to ask him, like, look, this, this might cause problems. Um, people might be upset about this. Are you okay with being political? And, Gusti's response was always, yeah, just, just do it, just do it, just don't worry about it. So the university is a safe space for continuing these conversations and art provided a, a forum. Can we look at, uh, the, before, so before the main piece, Nicotiana, there are a series of sketches, um, some of them with OHP uh, projected uh, shadow puppets, I guess in the manual cinema kind of inspired style. Um, do you want to set up the, the next clip which we're going to look at, which is one of these kind of uh, uh, preludes to the piece? Uh, I think this is a piece composed by Hannah, uh, or, or arranged by Hannah, Nyai um, Rorokidu. Uh, Do you want to tell us a little bit about this piece and why you decided to include this as a companion piece to uh, Nicotiana, Hannah? Sure. Um, so yeah, this is a piece, the lyrics are from the CB band, and it was originally a Dangdut song. And if you're not familiar, that's a kind of um, Indonesian pop music. Um, and so the, and the lyrics are about the Javanese queen of the South Sea. Um, so she still is very much loved. People pray to her for wealth and for beauty. Um, and there's a lot of mythology surrounding her um, so that she, um, people say you shouldn't swim in the South Sea or she'll take you. And she particularly likes young men um, and people who wear green. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so um, I've been interested in this character for a long time um, and used the lyrics and took them from uh, being a Dangrit pop song and put them into a Lankam Jawa piece um, and then uh, like you said, uh, you notice the overhead projection, and this is done in a collaboration with Beth Reed and, and Herbert Gray. Okay, so maybe we could take a look at... Uh... Get 
So I guess one of the functions of that piece, Hannah, was to to illustrate the kind of music which is in the play. Um, the yeah, um, all part of the overture, basically, kind of introducing, you know, trying to introduce um, the, the different styles of music and the kind of puppetry that we're going to be doing. Um, so kind of an easy warm up to a, a piece which is dense and described, I think, uh, by Andy in his introduction as a kind of a research project. Can we look at that second clip from Nicotiana, Emily? Sometimes wondered if the art scene we enjoy in Richmond is somehow built upon the suffering of our friends and teachers in places like Indonesia. This performance is essentially a research project and artistic response to the links that have been created between opposite ends of the world, Virginia and Indonesia, through the exploitation of engineered addiction. When we think about tobacco and cigarettes in America or Indonesia, we are thinking about the distribution of wealth, power, control, and health. Tobacco was cultivated as a medicinal and sacred plant in the Americas since at least 1000 BC. John Rolfe in Jamestown was the first colonist to grow tobacco, learning the complex art from the local Powhatan. In 1614, the first shipment was sent to England. As the forward movement of the panorama, how that mirrors the f movement of time, the insertion of agency with the shadows. There's such a, a, a formal elegance in, in this, this piece. And I also, the, as a lecture performance, I think it's a really interesting uh, mode of delivery, right? Where it's clearly not actors who are. Uh, who are speaking the this the, the this narration or or academic prose even? Um, what were the, what were the what were the surprising moments in the research for for each of you the, when you're when you're researching? Where were things which were completely unexpected? Had no idea existed. Um, well, right. The the well, first of all, that kind of form of the we were talking about Canastoria earlier before we actually went live, and and that was something that I was thinking about, right? That there's you know, the kind of lecture uh, component, which I'm familiar with, with the kind of story uh, form, but not necessarily with the cranky form, but having read about Henry Box Brown, that, that it was part of the moving panorama form. Um, whereas most of the, the crankies that I've seen in the, in the kind of cranky world nowadays are kind of accompanied by music or a ballad or a spoken story, but not necessarily, um, something that was intended to be educational or mm. in, infotational or, or whatever it's gonna be. Um, there were surprising elements to the history 
and and we each took turns reading different sections of the one of the stranger parts was a section that Hannah you read about Kellogg and gender I don't remember exactly I mean you I'm sure remember but oh no that's your darling Andy go ahead <laughs> but you you recited it it was uh, so Kellogg who found you know the the cereal magnet was concerned so when when tobacco was first introduced it was viewed as this thing that was very I don't know the things something that a dandy did from Europe right it wasn't masculine yeah. right yeah um, there were these things from Turkey um, they were very foreign and when folks like Lewis Ginter who you know Lewis Ginter Park is a is a beautiful park over here uh, on the other side of Richmond. When they started really marketing cigarettes here, it was first as a kind of cosmopolitan um, thing that, um, you know, hip city dwellers uh, uh, did. It wasn't until much later, till after, after World War I, that it became kind of associated with that kind of hyper-masculine, kind of Marlboro man image. But there were all of these hang-ups about gender mm. uh, when it was first introduced that, it would it would somehow zap your glands. I mean, it would somehow like you know screw up your proper gender and turn you uh, turn women into men and men into women and I don't know cats into dogs. It, you know, it was just going to mess everything up. And that was part of the kind of early homeopathic um, take on cigarettes. Was I didn't know about any of that stuff. So real buried history. Pat Gusti, how about you? What was, what was, at the Kajutan, Dalam Process Penlitian? Is there any surprises? Ya, sebenarnya tentang tobacco ini, sejarah tobacco, Pak Indi yang lebih banyak riset, tapi di Indonesia, sebenarnya terutama di Jawa, kan ini menjadi hal, apa ya, riset yang sangat fenomenal, karena ini menyangkut berbagai hal ya, tentang, sampai menyangkut tentang kekuasaan, tentang fee, tentang ekonomi, dan termasuk politik juga. Dan termasuk ke dalam sekup lingkungan organisasi keagamaan juga ada sangkut pautnya ini. gitu Tentang rokok ini, tentang rokok, tembako dan rokok. Nah di Bali, tembako memang berperan juga dalam hidup masyarakat Bali, tapi kaitannya dalam konteks orang makan sireh ya, nginang, makan nginang, ya di sana tembako peran penting nah, ada juga petani tembakau dan konteksnya memang dari kuno tembakau itu dan sirih itu memang ada disebutkan dalam lontar dalam dharma pewayangan juga seorang dalang harus makan sirih dan ada tembakau di sana dan dipakai juga untuk serana uh, apa namanya serma serana untuk sesuatu yang bersifat magic ya ada mantramnya untuk ini uh, dalang dan dan dukun atau sadar biasa melakukan itu nah itu menarik karena dalam sekup yang lebih luas dan global ini menjadi isu yang sangat cantik ya karena ada ada uang di sana ada kekuasaan ada ada konspirasi ya macam-macam nanti Pak Andy bisa lebih menjelaskan itu. Um, yeah, he, he's getting to some points that I, I think were really interesting and were raised in the, in the Indonesian language version of this this morning when when someone with an Indonesian viewer sent in a, a question about the role of tobacco in traditional Balinese um, ceremonial activity. And, and this is what Pakusti was saying. He said, first of all, he said, yeah, it's really interesting because it, it ties together all of these things like power and oppression and money and politics, but also, um, you know, religious activities. So he, he made this distinction in the earlier broadcast between roko, between cigarettes and tobacco in a way that I, I hadn't thought about it really until this morning. That same kind of division, even in the way it was thought about and used, appears to have been the case when tobacco was introduced from Native, by the Native Americans to, to um, English colonists. That it was understood as this medicinal plant and a sacred plant that was chewed. It wasn't smoked, especially the kind of tobacco that was uh, grown in, in Virginia. What Rolf starts growing are, is a very different kind of tobacco that's actually from the West Indies. Um, and then, then green leaf is a different kind that was, that was grown in Virginia specifically for uh, cigarettes. But the Dalang, I say Pat Gusti doesn't smoke, but he, he also often has tobacco in his lip as a shadow puppeteer. 
and and there are um, ceremonial practices around um, betel or or pinang um, siri that he was referencing, and there's special mantra associated with it, special um, ceremonial acts that happen before a shadow play. Um, that tobacco is used, uh, offered to the gods in um, traditional offerings, and we have this scene in in the piece uh, uh, accompanied by the, the music on the Gindo Wayang that you would perform for that. So he made this interesting distinction in the, in the earlier broadcast this morning between cigarettes associated with kind of global capitalism, uh, engineered addiction, kind of uh, systematic oppression of farmers. And we got another question from someone in Indonesia basically saying like, how are these farmers gonna eat otherwise, right? Um, the same kinds kinds of forms of kind of price manipulation and oppression of you know the farmers happened in America and then was exported to places like Indonesia. Pat Gusi made this really interesting distinction between that and the ceremonial uses of the plant, which I think we could connect, you know, just coincidentally to the Native American use of it. This is really really interesting. These different convergences and and uh, yeah, the mirroring situation of Bali and, and, and Virginia in particular. Um, let's have a look at, a, at another clip uh, out of uh, the play. Maybe you could set Sandy where we are in the story. Uh, is this where Hannah's reading about the master settlement agreement? That's right, yeah. Okay, so the, it's kind of set up chronologically. And one nice thing about the, the cranky that, that Beth Reed made is uh, we can move it back and forth. So at the beginning, the cranky is moving chronologically, and then we go to Indonesia, but then we need to talk about what happens after the master settlement agreement and how it becomes globalized in a different way, right? It becomes globalized through colonization by the Dutch, and this is when it's introduced and kind of domesticated in ceremonial practice in Indonesia and when clove cigarettes are invented in Indonesia. And then we can use the cranky to go back um, to America to talk about how after the master settlement agreement, groups like Philip Morris reposition themselves in, in Switzerland and rebrand their domestic industry, Altria, who now owns Juul and a lot of cannabinoid uh, companies. So you know, we can use the cranky uh, in two ways geographically. Um, yeah. And it, it can be kind of independent of chronology, which is fun. Let's have a look at that clip. Investigation in 1994 showed that cigarette companies had spiked their product with additional nicotine and other cancer-causing substances. The scale of the health effects, first indicated by the studies published decades earlier, started to become obvious. This led to the string of lawsuits against Big Tobacco, culminating in the Master Settlement Agreement in 1998. The major companies agreed to end advertising to youth. The agreement required the companies to pay billions to the states for 25 years until 2023. In return, the companies received immunity from future class action lawsuits. But states depended on the settlement for revenues, which were largely used to balance state budgets. Recognizing this, a J.R. Reynolds vice president said in 2003, there's no doubt that the largest financial stakeholder in the industry is our state governments. started feeling the pressures of anti-tobacco campaigns and regulation following the master settlement agreement, many of them turned to less regulated Asian markets. In Richmond, Philip Morris rebranded as Altria in 2003 and spun off Philip Morris International, placing its headquarters in Switzerland. Altria now owns Juul and several cannabinoid companies. Today, 90% of tobacco is grown overseas. China produces seven times the amount of tobacco as the U.S. It is more profitable than ever, even while farmers' shares of profits have dwindled. Philip Morris International had annual net revenue of $30 billion in 2018, 
Altria's was 26 billion. We're now hearing these numbers, billions, which sound very impressive. A few weeks ago, <laughs> we've become so accustomed to trillions of dollars. Yeah, what's a billion? A lot in the last uh, few weeks. Um, for the viewers out there, if, if you want to start to think about questions you'd like to have in the, the Q&A, uh, we're going to uh, shift a little bit uh, into uh, talking about uh, the making of the video, which we've been watching, and also the afterlife of this project. Um, but um, this is something, that while you were putting this together, um, things were changing so quickly global situation uh, and maybe you could outline how you were responding both practically in terms of the putting this to, or putting closing down the project and also thematically how it, how it came into the, the actually the, the, the COVID situation. Yeah we were scheduled to do a bunch of gigs um, and the last one was going to be up at UConn. And, you know, there's a lot of improvisation in the process. Whenever you're working with a Dalang, it's best to be improvisatory and to be able to kind of react on the fly. And, um, you know, we don't storyboard the stuff. Dalangs don't, you know, nail everything down. Um, and part of the challenge is to be able to improvise together. And, um, and so you really just need to perform to get good at that, especially for the for puppeteers to work with each other. Uh, and that process didn't happen. Um, and we hope for it to happen when things open up and, and we're planning on bringing Pot Gusti back next year. So then we had to suddenly shift into, um, you know, getting cameras and um, getting audio equipment right when the university was shutting everything down and saying, okay, no more than 10 people, students have got to go away. And we had 11 people in the room and I was hoping the police weren't going to come by. And two of our members uh, were having symptoms. And especially at the very beginning of, of this process, I think we were even more on edge, right? And um, I don't know if we'll ever know if any of us had COVID um, uh, or minor symptoms, but you know we wanted to be as careful as we could. So there, there are instruments that you hear on that recording that you cannot see because those folks were at home and then you know later recorded with them in one end of this room and me with a mask and gloves at the other end of the room and then mixing it down. It's totally bizarre because those musicians give us cues as part of the process. It was very kind of unnatural and and stressful. Um, and then we had to figure out, not being video editors, how to put that together and send a, send a video along. So um, certainly stressful and unusual, but those kinds of processes also kind of make you feel like when everything opens up and we can schedule gigs, we're ready to do this. You know, it's really gotta, it's gotta not be that stressful once we can actually get this in front of people. In this morning's Q and A, there were certainly people who are urging you to go to Bali with the show as well. So maybe who knows? There'll be some opportunities there. Maybe the cigarette uh, company is a underwriter for us. Sorry. <laughs> Never mind. Pakusti, do you want to add something? To bagaimana tu bikin ini karya seni dalam keadaan ane COVID ini coronavirus? Yeah. Ini menarik karena bagi saya, bagi kami, bagi kita, karena justru uh, bisa melewati tantangan pada saat kita proses itu ya, yang tidak terduga. Nah di sana kadang-kadang kita harus dituntut apa lebih kreatif, kreatif ya untuk bisa apa uh, melanjutkan proses itu. Misalnya seperti musisi tiba-tiba tidak -tiba bisa ikut rekaman. Nah ini, ini gimana? Ini agak sulit untuk teman-teman musisi karena mereka klik semuanya ya masing-masing ada kode ada cue mereka main bagaimana scene by scene nah, itu itu susah tapi tapi bisa lewat bisa bisa dapat gitu bisa dapat nah bagi saya di wayang itu re relatif apa ya melihat memberikan respon kepada kepada awal musik misalnya kepada scene apa yang diperlukan 
seberapa saya bisa masuk dalam durasi waktu yang pendek itu. Nah itu dituntut apa kreativitas yang 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 cukup menguras pikiran ya karena waktunya pendek, sen itu juga pendek. Nah itu bagaimana kita masuk supaya ada ruang di sana dan kita bisa isi dengan wayang. Nah, begitu. Gimana? Yeah, Pak Kusi, was, uh, you want to translate? You want me yeah, to? Please. Okay. Well, he he was saying that yeah. I mean, it's everything's uh, stressful and it was a real challenge to have musicians who weren't there and suddenly you have to adapt and you have to you have to work what you, with what you have. But I mean, this is this has been a great lesson of working with Indonesian artists that their artistry is so high, but they can always make it work out. And this is, you know, Pakusi was staying at our house uh, as all this was happening. And the, my mornings were filled with basically being on, you know, trying to get through to Korean airlines to figure out how to get them back. And is Indonesia going to close? And Gusti's wife has some pretty serious asthma and being really worried that someone with a potentially compromised um, immune system was in my care and how are we going to do this? So it was, it was really stressful. But there's this wonderful saying in Balinese, desa kala patra, you know, time, place, and context. You got to just make it work out with what you got. And you can, you can work it out if you're flexible. If you're kind of honest about what you have in front of you right here and now, you can do your best and you can work it out. And, and one of the most amazing things about Pat Gusti's artistry is he's really, really up here. And we're his students. And he could just leave us in the dust all the time. Right? He could just be like, this is how it is. This is how we do it in Bali. You have to play faster and you have to do this. But he kind of lives by this, by this maxim, right? You know, they're able to do this right now. I'm going to do this and that fits with that. And I'm going to try to bring them up to the next level gently without pushing them over the edge, right? I mean, he's just, he's amazing at that. And, and we're really lucky to, to be able to work with artists that are that generous. <laughs> I think there are a couple of questions from uh, John Bell, which have been held off. Maybe you can use this opportunity, John. Sure, I'm, I'm very excited to, to hear you all talking about your work and uh, especially the, the interpolations of puppetry that, 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 that you're working with and uh, I think for American puppeteers, it's always interesting to try to understand other puppet traditions around the world. And, and reading Matthew's work in particular, uh, one gets a sense of the history of, of Indonesian culture and also the, the, in, the incredible uh, global back and forth that, that has happened over the past few hundred years in terms of Wayang and, and other different forms of Wayang and other forms of Indonesian culture. In the US, um, there's uh, another aspect of this cult cultural cross-fertilization that's filled with um, stress and anxiety, largely in, in the relationship between white artists and in particular African-American culture and African-American music. And the term cultural appropriation is a kind of almost a, a cliched word right now, but one that is kind of vivid in, in, in the minds and, and in, I think, discussions, you know, even at, at our university. And I, I was um, wondering, I, I wanted to ask, because it seems like you all are negotiating these questions in a really interesting and, and it seems like a productive way, but I, I wanted to ask um, Pak Gusti uh, how he f addresses those issues of Indonesian art, Wayang, being connected with or transformed or uh, created in collaboration with American artists and others. Is there a, f a fear that something is lost in, in this, which I think characterizes f uh, feelings about cultural appropriation in different contexts? Oke, okay. uh, nanti Mas Hendy yang terjemahkan. Uh, okay. uh, mungkin maksudnya waktu kolaborasi ya. Uh, dalam proses kolaborasi, bagi saya sendiri sebagai uh, dalang wayang kulit Bali, 
Mungkin yang saya bawa adalah bukan dalam konteks tradisi ya, kita harus masuk kepada konsep yang kita lakukan dengan yang diajak berkolaborasi gitu. Sehingga yang paling penting adalah inti daripada uh, wayang itu apa sih? Nah, itu yang 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 saya pakai untuk berdialog dalam proses kolaborasi itu. Itu 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 dulu. Mas Hendi silakan. The most important thing is the is the essence or uh, in the collaboration and and trying to get to that issue first. I think that's what he's saying. Before we before we worry about other issues of, um, of harming tradition, trying to get trying to get to the essence of of what is the point of the collaboration. I think. I think also the essence of Wayang as well. No. So, yeah. the important thing is maintaining that essence. It's not about all the trappings of that, but the key essential uh, of what Wayang is to be maintained. Monggo, lanjut. Mau lanjut? Ya, apa intinya pertanyaannya? Maaf, saya lewat. Jadi, uh, intinya, ya, intinya apa kolaborasi bisa merusak tradisi? Atau bisa, oh. <laughs> apa, atau kalau, uh, apa orang Amerika bisa mencuri intinya, bisa mencuri, uh, mencuri tradisinya? Ada takut itu apa enggak? Sebenarnya bagi saya sendiri pribadi tidak sih ya karena dibilang merusak tradisi kan enggak kita tidak justru membawa apa tradisi itu ses sebagai sesuatu yang berkembang terus ya bagi saya karena tradisi itu bukan sesuatu yang mati ya kalau mati ya tidak tradisi lagi dia tradisi dalam konteks saya itu sesuatu yang hidup berarti fleksibel sekali dalam konteks kehidupan itu sendiri nah oleh karena itu saya tidak tidak khawatir sekali, tapi bagi saya, saya punya etika sendiri dalam diri saya untuk memperlakukan bagaimana saya memperlakukan tradisi itu. Sehingga saya tidak begitu khawatir ketika berkolaborasi ini akan apa seperti merusak rendah. Karena dalam proses kolaborasi itu kita kan sebenarnya mendialogkan ya, mendialogkan bertemu dengan tradi antara tradisi satu dengan tradisi yang lainnya. Itu yang menariknya sebenarnya bagi saya. Uh, itu yang saya lakukan biasanya gitu sehingga nah masalah bagaimana nanti tradisinya misalnya tradisi Bali atau di bukan dalam konteks dicuri ya apa kalau orang Amerika misalnya belajar tentang kesenian Indonesia Jawa Bali oke okay sama saja seperti orang Bali belajar gitar atau apa saja ini sudah sesuatu yang global seperti menjadi suatu kebutuhan dan seperti punya kita ya, berarti kita memperlakukannya sebagai punya kita sendiri. Nah, itu menarik sekali bagi saya. Itu mas. I'm having a little bit of deja vu because I, we've had a lot of this conversation in that exact spot right there. Um, he he said many things, but one of them was that it, tradition is living, and especially Balinese tradition is living and is flexible. So if you treat it as something that's dead and static, it's not anything that we recognize as tradition and worth keeping anymore. Um, it, it has to live and therefore it has, to, by living it has to, it consumes, right? And some of what it consumes are the elements of other cultures. And it's, it's regenerating itself. And it's, it's regenerating itself in an active dialogue with other traditions and with other cultures. Um, and and Pak Gusti and I have talked about a lot of examples of this that go way, way, way back. And like in any culture, you scratch the surface and the origins are borrowed and, and transformed locally. And, 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 you know, the center of Balinese traditions is, is, is also like that. Uh, but then he also said, but I've got a personal ethical guide and I've got a personal ethics about how I decide what's right and what's appropriate in any time, place and context. And, but then he, he said, you know, there are elements of culture that are essentially global and anyone should feel they have access to it. And guitar, you know, Balinese can play guitar without getting, uh, having hangups about it. And Pat Sadra, um, who we mentioned earlier, would often describe that about gamelan. Well, if a guitar can be global, why can't gamelan? Um, but, but it's different, right? And I think we, I sometimes push back and it's like, yeah, but, we, but there's still appropriation going on. We still can't appropriate. 
Um, it doesn't come up as often as the African-American issue because it's, it, there's not the same history of race relations. Um, there was never forced migration of Indonesians to America. It's just, it's going to be a different conversation. And the Balinese have been acculturated to mass tourism since the colonial era. And that's so baked in to um, the Balinese worldview. Mass tourism has been the prime economy since the 70s or 80s. And that kind of welcoming attitude, especially to certain people from certain economies is, is, is really deeply embedded in the culture. We have a question which has come in through Facebook uh, 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 regarding a scene in Nicotiana where um, packs of cigarettes are made uh, as offerings. And uh, the question is, uh, have any of you heard from any Balinese people their take on this part of cosmology? Uh, maybe as it pertains to the, uh, the presence of cigarette smoke in artistic events. Cigarettes equals appeasing spirits to presence of tobacco equals perception of people uh, of how people smoking are viewed. It's a little bit garbled, but I think you get the, the essence of that. I, I don't know if I get the essence. Pak Gusi, ngerti itu? So, jelaskan lagi dikit poin ya. Kosmologinya ini merokok itu. Kenapa uh, rokok itu jadi ini? Sajen di, di Bali, apa oh. uh, tembakau itu uh, uh, ada hubungan dengan ini, dengan ini leluhur atau dengan dewa-dewa atau apa itu? Nah, ini sebenarnya menarik bagi orang Bali kan sangat apa ya, sangat adaptif dan berimprovisasi ya. Misalnya contoh sekarang. Uh, permen aja bisa jadi bagian dari offering ya, dari Banten, sesajen, permen loh, cake atau apa saja. Nah bagi orang Bali, apa yang mereka punya, apa yang mereka persembah, uh, itu yang mereka persembahkan, apa yang mereka konsumsi kadang-kadang itu persembahkan. Nah sama seperti rokok, nah kapan mulainya, siapa yang mulai? Kadang-kadang di canang, tiba-tiba ada rokok, ada kita ke dukun, atau apa, uh, Bantennya pasti ada rokok, nah. Nah, kenapa pakai rokok? Rokok saya juga tidak ngerti ini. Apa ada hubungannya dengan uh, apa lagi uh, dunia yang apa nih skala udah saya kurang tahu. Tapi begitulah orang Bali sangat apa adaptif ya. Artinya apa aja dipersembahkan gitu. Nah, terlepas daripada cocok dan tidak cocok, tepat dan tidak tepat. Nah, bagi saya untuk persembahan saya saya tidak pakai rokok gitu. Tapi ada dalam konteks tradisi Banten itu Memang ada pakai rokok gitu, uh, misalnya pesucian itu ada pakai rokok. Cuma saya tidak ketemu sumbernya, misalnya sastra di lontar itu ada gak memang rokok, rokok ya bukan tembakau ya, rokok itu dipersembahkan sebagai banten. Nah, tapi belakangan banyak biasa, bukan belakangan dari dulu saya lihat ada aja yang banten pakai rokok gitu. Itu sangat sangat apa dalam dalam persembahan kekinian maksudnya bukan dalam persembahan konteks upacara yang khusus di pura bukan. Misalnya orang di mana satu tempat ada yang angker tiba-tiba uh, kasih canang ada rokok nah seperti itu. Kalau sekarang ada permen, nah permen dipakai juga gitu. Nah kenapa? Nah begitulah orang Bali. Apa yang punya itu dipersembahkan seperti begitu. Ya, yeah, he, he he made this reference to well, you know, now peppermints are used or sweets are used and it's kind of anything that might be new and interesting or valued or that could be consumed by um, by deities or, or by, uh, uh, by demonic forces could be consumed. And so there's yet another distinction he's making here. Earlier he talked about tobacco used in ways that might uh, kind of resonate with earlier Native American practices, but it is the case that cigarettes, modern cigarettes are used sometimes in really elaborate um, designs in offerings and you know, he, he connected this to the use of other kind of prestigious elements from other cultures that might be used in the temple, Chinese plates built into the, um, built into the architecture of the, of the temple. And, and this is something actually that he and I were going back and forth a lot about as we were making this, like, well, when did this start? And, and really, what do people think about it? And he, he 
you know, he was saying, I'm confused. I don't know when it started. I don't do it, but that's a personal decision. Um, you know, and I was saying like, well, is, is the smoke from the cigarette thought of as, is it performing the same function as the dupa, as the incense? And, you know, we, we don't know. We, you know, it's just practice. It's orthopraxy that isn't really, that people don't talk about explicitly. Well, why are we doing this? And when did it begin? Um, but yeah, cigarettes, cigarettes are used. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe they're sponsored. Maybe ceremonies are being sponsored by cigarette companies. I don't know. Surreptitiously, yeah, <laughs> literally. Yeah. So we have a final question here regarding, uh, and this is a question to Hannah, regarding the uh, connections uh, or maybe distinctions between American old time string music and uh, Kronchow. And maybe you want to elaborate on that, Hannah. Sure. Uh, yeah, so we can, I mean, we can trace the instruments from these two ensembles, from American old time uh, bands and from Kronchow groups. We can trace them all back to Europe at some point, right? So that the instruments that we think of as part of the Kronchow ensemble, which might look like ukuleles, but are called chuk and chak, and the cello, which is actually called a cello. Um, these, you know, we can trace these back to Europe, um, and they arrived at various times. Um, some of the earliest instruments um, came with the Portuguese when they were exploring what was in the Spice Islands in the 15th century. Um, so in terms of instruments, if we're talking organology, we can trace back there. Um, but now, in terms of practice, I think we've found a lot of interesting parallel threads. Um, so just in terms of like the way that a lot of times if you're at a crunchong, uh, a kind of crunchong jam, like not a performance, but even kind of that performance is people are circled in, you're facing each other, and that you see this in old time music as well, like that, that it feels much more communal, it's, and like, and that, it's, you know, it is performed as well, and then you have your stage divas, and that's part of it, but like, if you're just in the kampung, if you're just in the village, like people are circled in and you're just kind of playing together. Um, and then um, in terms of the music, Andy talked about this a little bit, um, but I think one of the interesting, my favorite kind of kranchong music is langam jawa kranchong, so Javanese style kranchong, which is approximating the tuning systems on the instruments that you see behind Andy of the gamelan, so slendro and pelog. And so it's approximating those. Um, and that a lot of old time music already is kind of in slendro, right? It's already almost in this pentatonic key or sometimes fully in these pentatonic keys. Um, so that overlays really nicely. Um, and then I guess I, I just wanna say, cause this, this kind of circles back to like, um, you know, what, yeah, yeah, why, you know, why the connection, I guess, uh, which is, wasn't necessarily a part of your question, but I think it's a good one, but like, why the connection? And I feel like that's part of what came out for me in this research and that like, and that it might, it might have not been, it might have not popped out at me in the same way if we hadn't done this kind of like narration style research um, performance, but that, but that through this material, like through tobacco, you can see the ways that these two places are linked. That I think for people who are into Indonesian music, if you're an American and you're into, into Indonesian music, you already know. But I think for a lot of people, it's kind of like, why Indonesian music? Um, and I mean, there is a deep connection there. And I think that the story really demonstrates that. And you can see, you know, there's all these other ways too, but you can see this thread and how we're both affecting each other. And then the parallels of the history and the, the aesthetics are really, really interesting. I get one last question, if we can push our envelope a little bit further, just kind of came in through, uh, through Facebook uh, Live as well. This is to uh, Pat Gusti and wants to know about, again, a musical question about timbang uh, and uh, what, how, what the challenges are uh, to use timbang in a story about uh, tobacco. Jadi tantangannya nembang, tapi ceritanya tembako itu. Pertanyaan untuk Pak Gusti. Oh ya ya. Uh, bagi saya uh, tembang itu bukan narasinya lagi, tapi bagaimana melodi apa ya melodi yang kita tembangkan dalam 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 tembako ini yang paling penting sebenarnya untuk saya. Jadi ini sangat improvisasi sekali ya. Kita melihat apa uh, 
pelarasan daripada alat musiknya bagaimana, lalu konteksnya dengan scene itu bagaimana. Nah itu yang paling penting sebenarnya. Sehingga saya tidak membawa nyanyian apa tradisi yang utuh yang apa lalu dimasukkan ke bukan. Jadi ini semua tembangnya merupakan apa respon saya terhadap sin dan terhadap musik yang telah digarap. Itu cara saya. Terima kasih. Oh, right. Um, right, not everyone understood that. Um, <laughs> um, he said it's he's not using traditional vocal forms like, you know, poo 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 the traditional forms that none of those are necessarily about tobacco um, but that he's improv improvising and that that it's not necessarily uh, presenting the narration and in fact you know Pakusi is kind of renowned as as a vocalist and as someone who can enter into many different kinds of, of styles um, as a vocalist and in fact you know one of the threads that goes through the almost the entire piece is the lucky strike ad which you know I mean there was a huge um, industry in making tobacco jingles in the 30s. He's very tight, really catchy. Da, 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 da. I mean, so catchy that I haven't been able to get the Lucky Strike tune out of my head for about a month and a half now. My nine-year-old has it stuck in his head, which is kind of bad, and I feel bad about that. Um, but we transformed that tune from the original into the like three different Cronchong styles, and then all the way into Pelog. It's all the Lucky Strike tune, but by the time we get to the end, I don't think the guy that composed it would have recognized it as that one. But Pak Gusti's improvising along with that as it goes through all of these different transformations. And if I think like who could do that, I think it's like Penny Chandrarini and Pak Gusti could do that. A wonderful example of collaboration, it's finest. I think we've reached the end of our time here. I'll hand it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. John Bell. Well, thank you, Matthew. This has been extraordinarily fascinating and exciting and, and rich. I hope that you all can come in person to the University of Connecticut to, to perform um, all of this uh, wonderful uh, material, these wonderful shows, this wonderful music. I wanted to thank um, Hannah Standiford and, and Igusti Putu Sudarta and Matthew Cohen and Andy McGraw for, for taking part in this. Also behind the scenes, um, our, our undergraduate student, Tracy Becker, and also my colleague, our manager of operations and collections, Emily Wicks, who have been doing all sorts of uh, backstage stuff to make the, this online uh, presentation happen. I did want to mention that um, in, uh, in large part because of uh, Emily's uh, quick-footed, quick-witted changes, we've shifted all of our programming online for, for the, uh, the present and, and the foreseeable future. So we're doing um, uh, weekly workshops, puppet workshops on Wednesday and Friday afternoons at two o'clock. We're in the middle of a uh, steam and puppetry workshop with Felicia Cooper. That'll be tomorrow at two and uh, next Wednesday, uh, followed by a, a scarf marionette workshop on, on Friday with Maggie Flanagan. Uh, graduate student Abby Bosley will present the making of puppets helping pets work uh, related to her, her MFA uh, degree Wednesday, May 6th at 7 p.m. online. And then uh, on Thursday and Friday, May 7th and 8th, our Puppet Arts program will be presenting final presentations by our students. Uh, those are also at, I want to say, 7 o'clock, uh, uh, also on the Ballard Institute channel, channel, Ballard Institute Facebook feed. And we're planning to do more forums and interviews and presentations and workshops uh, throughout the, the summer. So please, please check in on us. So having said that, again, th thank you so much. This has been so rich. I want to thank all of you for, for coming here and making this happen and come back again. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.